Matthew chapter 10, in verses 16 through 23 this morning. Uh, it, I tell you, it is good to be here. It is good to see you. It's good to worship. Uh, Dan was telling me, giving me a little testimony of how somebody in Albuquerque, New Mexico, found a track, a million dollar bill, and on the back of it, it had pressing on ministry stamped. And so they called Dan this week, talked to him, and shared with him. I just got saved. I was re- on the back of this bill. I'm reading the gospel. And, uh, that's exciting. That is really exciting to hear that God has, that we have played a part in the salvation of people. And, um, making ourselves available to shepherd, disciple the people who God, whom God saves. What a joy, what a blessing. Um, praise God for his goodness. Praise God that he cares. And as we just so wonderfully sung, for his mercy, he has shown great mercy to us. He is a God of mercy, as Ephesians chapter 4. But God, rich, who is rich in his mercy, has saved us by his grace. That's the God that we serve And as we open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, and we'll begin to look at verse 16 in a moment, these are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are the words of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. These are the words of the judge of all the universe, the creator of all things. These are his words, and this is what he says. And so they are extremely important, critical, necessary for us in order so that we can know, in order for us to live a life pleasing to live wisely, to live skillfully, to praise him and to honor him. We must know his scripture. That's why we open up scripture. That's why scripture plays such a central role in every church it should. The pulpit ought to be around and the word of God ought to be the the benchmark around everything that the church rotates. It is the center point. It It is how to think. It is how to live. It is how to react to things in life. It is hope. It is the victory in the future. All of this is here in the Word of God, and it is truth. It is inspired. It is giving to us for correction, reproof, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fit and able to minister to one another. That's why we open up the Word. That's why we center on this ministry on the Word of God as we do, because it is truth. It is the absolute objective standard by which our lives are anchored. And if you don't have this, you float You're subject to the the whims of society. You're subject to the whims of your own sense of fairness, whatever that might mean. And you have no basis. But we do have a basis. We do have a foundation. And that's what this conference in October 25th and 26th is all about. It's the Word of God. Men are going to be preaching on passages like 2 Corinthians 3.18, Hebrews 4.12, John 17, Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. Those are some of the passages that uh, Phil Johnson and Dave Dorn are going to be preaching on. It's going to be absolutely wonderful. So I encourage you to be here as we focus on those passages that specifically speak about the Word of God and its effect and its power in us. So I hope you'll, that you will enjoy, that you will participate, and I'm sure that you will enjoy the fellowship and the teaching. But you know, the mission of the church is, is to take the truth, the gospel, to every living being so that they may glorify God on account of his wisdom as expressed in his plans. That's what the church is to do. That's why we're here. If you ever wondered, why did God not take me to heaven when he saved me? He left me here. For what purpose? To go into all the world and to share the gospel and preach the gospel to every living creature so that they too might be exposed to the truth and they too might believe. The church is the mystery that Paul spoke of in Ephesians chapter 3. The church is an instrument to make Israel jealous, according to Romans 11. The church is also an instrument through which the wisdom of God is now made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places, according to Ephesians 3. But her mission is to scatter among the wolves. That's what our mission is, to scatter among the wolves and to take the gospel with us and to proclaim that gospel. In our passage here in Matthew, Jesus is or has delegated power, has delegated some power to his apostles. They're called apostles for the first time, and I believe the only time in Matthew's gospel, in verse 2, the name of the 12 apostles. 
So he's delegated some power to them. This is declaration of this power delegated to them. It encompasses a large section beginning at chapter 9, verse 35, and goes all the way to chapter 11 and verse 1. And a couple of weeks ago, we looked at verses 35 through 38 of chapter 9. That's a report that prepares for the next block of material. That verses 35 through 38 prepares us for chapter 10. Because of the spiritual condition of Israel, like lost sheep, wandering sheep, and the fact that there are few laborers, and, of course, that Jesus has compassion on his people, he took the twelve... In chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, And he said to them, Do not go to any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That is the mission to the twelve. That's in verses 5 through 15. The mission to the twelve. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we, last week we examined where they should go, their message, their provisions, and what they should expect as they are traveling around the uh, area of Galilee, the northern part of Israel, taking the gospel and healing every kind of disease as they go. Do not go to the Gentiles, he says. Do not go to the Samaritans, but go to Israel. And that was a a sort of a, it sounds different to us, but it was a unique direction in the ministry of our Lord Jesus. And the reason that he says go to Israel is because Israel was the recipient of the promises of the Old Testament. Ephesians 2 and verses 11 and following speak to that as well. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant was made with and to Israel. A promise of a physical kingdom was made to them. One commentator says, if Jesus proclaimed a kingdom consisting only of a spiritual salvation now present for all in the church, why was the message limited to Israel? And of course, the answer is he did not limit it to Israel. Those covenants contain provisions for the Gentiles, by the min- but the ministry was to go first to the Jew. And if you've read the book of Acts, and you might remember, that was Paul's practice, to always go to the Jew. He went to the synagogue, he went to the Jew first. Romans 1.16 expresses this, the salvation of God, the gospel of God is the power of God, it is the light of God to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. In chapter 13 of Acts, chapter 18, chapter 19, chapter 28, all of those show that Paul's practice was to go to the synagogue first. And then after the synagogue rejected him, he would shake the dust off his sandals and turn to the Gentiles. And most of the time, the Gentiles would rejoice because now they heard the gospel and they received the gospel and many of them were saved. The chapter 10 is long. We've covered just the first 15 verses Actually, in one message. Thank you very much. Chapter 10 is 42 verses long. And there are three sections in chapter 10. And the marker, how do we know what the sections are? The marker in the text is a phrase that is recorded for us. And it is the phrase, truly I say to you. And you see that in verse 15. Truly I say to you, it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah and the day of judgment for them for that city. We see it in verse 23. Whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you. And then you see it again in verse 42. Whoever in the name of, this, of the disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Every time you see the phrase, truly I say to you, it identifies the end of the section. So you have verses 1 through 15, verse 15, truly I say to you. You have another section, 16 through verse 23, verse 23, I truly I say to you. And then the last section in chapter 10 is 24 through 42, with that same phrase occurring in verse 42. That's how we know the section is broke down or divided into those three larger sections. We happen to be this morning on the middle one, verses 16 through 23. That's the verses 1 through 15 was the mission of the the apostles. Now we're looking at the hazard and harassment that apostles and all disciples of Christ should expect as they take the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Hazard 
and harassment, verses 16 through 23. So let's read that. Read to yourself, uh, silently to yourself, and let's work our way through there. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. This is the future of apostolic ministry. This is the future of us as well. Opposition is the heart of this section. There's no secret there. We just need to do a cursory reading and we can see that. The primary application, of course, is to the apostles. But not during their brief mission, verses 5 through 15, not during that period, the apostles did not raise the dead, as it says they would do in verse 8. They did not do this during their brief mission in Galilee, nor at any other time during Jesus' ministry when he was here on earth, nor did they themselves experience direct persecution or suffering until after Pentecost. And after the day of Pentecost, which happened in Acts chapter 2, in the spread of the gospel in the church, there was opposition. Acts chapter 4, they arrested Peter and John. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Acts chapter 7, they stoned Stephen. So, The apostles here have both a short term, verses 5 through 15, and a long and long term instructions, verses 16 through 23. And those long term instructions apply to you and I as well. The principle, to say this another way, the principle, the truth of how people will react to the gospel, also goes beyond the ministry of Jesus on earth and beyond the lives of the apostles, as verse 23 clearly says. This passage is a valid warning for all believers of what we could expect as we share this gospel, as we live this gospel, as we tell the truth to others around us. We can expect, though it doesn't mean that every time we will experience this, but you can expect this kind of, Of repercussion, this kind of response. The structure of verses 16 through 23, verse 16 is a broad, general truth. It's an overall statement of danger. It uses the imagery of sheep and the wolves, very, very common. Verses 17 through 23 identifies the wolves. They may at once appear to be sheep, but they're later later proved to be wolves. So verses 17 through 23 identifies the wolves. There are certain types of attacks. There are areas of attacks, areas of life from which the persecution or the response will come from. And we'll look at all of those. We will not have time to get through all of them because there is, there is so much to be said about some of these verses. So let's look at verse 16, this broad general truth, the overall statement of danger, and then we'll begin to look at the areas of where that our persecution will come from. So verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Our Lord begins with a behold, you, and you have to admit that Jesus does not withhold truth, even when the truth is difficult, even when he knows it's going to be confusing and it's not going to be well-liked, We have to admit that our Lord never never withholds the truth. He never misleads. He never gives the wrong impression. He never allows ignorance to prevail. So with a emphatic, with an emphatic, behold, I, and the I there is emphatic. He essentially said, do not miss this. 
Jesus was calling attention to what follows. It is I who am sending you. Isn't that odd? Verse 16 was a real curiosity for me for a while. Years. First, first of all, because the picture here is of a helpless little flock of sheep in the midst of a group of wolves. They're standing around, gnashing their teeth, drooling, waiting to assault helpless, a helpless flock of sheep. Now, why is Jesus doing that? That doesn't sound like the gentle, meek, and mild that, I, that the liberals say that Jesus is. He's putting you <laughs> in an arena with wolves, and you're a sheep. How meek and mild and compassionate and, is that? But that's exactly what he's doing. There is, there's nothing inviting in this picture. It doesn't look like the pictures of Jesus holding the little lamb that I've seen. It isn't, it, I mean, isn't Jesus supposed to be meek and gentle and mild and wolves infiltrate and attack? That's what they do. It's completely contrary for a sheep to walk into a den of wolves. Is this verse really inspired? Perhaps we've asked that. Because our Lord is knowingly, deliberately sending the apostles into a dangerous and hostile world. And the comparison here of which is, is like sheep or as sheep in the midst of wolves. And secondly, why are believers called sheep anyway? Have you ever wondered about that? Believers are called sheep because they are vulnerable and defenseless here in the context. Here in the context, they are defenseless, they are vulnerable, they have no way of defending themselves. Their uh, sheep's only recourse is to run. You ever seen how fast a sheep runs? You could catch him. There, I mean, the picture is here, there is no hope. You are, there is, your end is coming. <laughs> and I'm going to throw you in an arena with all of these wolves. Thirdly, another third curiosity, and we'll continue to answer these as we go through here. In chapter 9, verse 36, you remember what he says in chapter 9, verse 36? Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Now, in chapter, in that verse, in chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus called all of the Jews... He's in Galilee at the time. He called all of the Jews sheep. He, he, he had been ministering about, going about, and the general truth, as he saw, he says, seeing the people, he's interacting with them, he felt compassion because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So at that point, he called all of the Jews there, his fellow countrymen, sheep. Saved and unsaved alike. He called all of them sheep in that verse. He had compassion on them. And he sent the apostles to them. Verses 1 through 15. Now he is warning them. And he changes the imagery. The sheep here are real believers. When we get to verse 16. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. In the analogy he's changing the terms. Because sheep in verse 16 really mean believers. I'm sending believers out amongst unbelievers. Sheep here are real believers, and the wolves are the unbelievers. So here is the warning that he's given. These bewildered, wandering, poor sheep, verse 6, are there by choice. They're there by choice. No doubt, according to verse 6, the shepherds share some of the blame. But as you go out, it will be a mistake to think people, Jew or Gentile, will welcome news of their accountability and sin before God their creator. Many will not like to hear that their lifestyle is wrong. There will be opposition. Some who are sheep According to verses 1 through 15, some who are sheep, meaning they are Jews, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, are in reality wolves. These same people that you thought would listen and thought would receive, even 
your own family and brother. When you share the gospel with them, they may not welcome that news. I know that comes as a shock to all of us. They may not like that. They may look at you as, oh my, what has my son or daughter gotten into now? They just might do that. Because these people in verses 1 through 15, sheep saved and unsaved, some of those sheep are really wolves. And the first category he's going to look, look at is religion, people who are religious. And probably the most dangerous people are the ones who are most devout. And we'll talk about that as, when we get there. But there's a lot between now, between there, where we're at now and where we get there. So he's warning them. Don't believe that everybody is going to be is going to welcome the news with open arms. So we might ask, why send them? If this is going to be a situation like sheep in the midst of wolves, then why even send them? Because according to Romans chap- or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. That's why he does it. Because in the wisdom of God and His infinite justice and righteousness in His infinite wisdom, He has determined to use people to take the message and share with other people. He was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. That's why He's sending them out. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. No one can be saved unless they hear the truth about Jesus Christ. Well, don't they have general revelation? They have creation. They see all these things. Absolutely, they do. And what does Romans one twenty three say? They worship and serve the creation rather than the creator. Why do you think people are so religious? Why do you think religion is incurable in humanity? Because we were built to worship a creator. But when we don't have the knowledge of how to know him, where to go to find him, we respond in a totem pole. We respond in a little fat man sitting down. We respond in whatever kind of dreams we come up with. That's our response apart from the revelation of God. That's the best you can do. The absolute best you can do is be a moral person. And so many people in the world have said, just be sincere and moral, and, and the Bible says, no, you can't get to heaven by being moral. That's the, that's the response of people apart from the special revelation of God, the message of the truth coming from Scripture. So why send them, Jesus, if you're sending them out into an almost certain disaster? Because it is God's plan his wisdom he is well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe that's why he's doing it another passage in Luke chapter 10 and verse 21 listen to this at the very time he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said I praise you father this is our Lord speaking O father Lord of heaven and earth that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants yes father For this way was well-pleasing in your sight. That too is well-pleasing in his sight. Whom God chooses to save is well-pleasing in his sight. It's part of God's wisdom. His infinite wisdom. And so we would respond as Paul did in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. We fall on our face is our response to God's wisdom and God's plan. And we worship Him. And we praise Him. And we cry out, why God did you save me? Of all the people in the world, why me? Because it was the Father's good pleasure to do so. It certainly wasn't because of what you might have to offer. Or your looks. Or I can say that about me anyway. It wasn't for any of those reasons. It was God's good pleasure. And so our response is... On our face, we, we, we sort of live on our face. 
We live in that worship position, a, a living sacrifice, Romans 12 says, continually sacrificing a continual life of pleasing God and seeking to serve God because this life lasts 70, 80, maybe 90 years and it's done and it's like this much compared to eternity. So what I have to do and what you have to do, we have a limited amount of time to do it, to do it in which to do it. God is preparing us for heaven. You are preparing yourself for heaven. You're getting ready to spend eternity with God. So how are you doing? When the Lord calls, are you ready to go? That's why God sends them. That's why he sends us. Because he has compassion on the sheep. People of the world, he has compassion. And here's the command to them. The command to them is, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. That has been a curiosity of mine for a while, along with the rest of the verse. But that one especially. The word be is, there, is the command. Be shrewd as serpents. The word shrewd means sensible or prudent. Maybe your translation uses a different word. But it means prudent or sensible or wise. It's not the word Sophia. Sophos is wisdom. That's the word that we're probably more familiar with. It's not that word. It's another word. But it means uh, prudent or wise. In math, turn, turn back to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. And we'll show you uh, throughout the Gospel of Matthew a few times where it's used. Matthew 7 and verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man, a prudent man. That's your word right there. A prudent man. Uh, Chapter 24 in in Matthew. Chapter 24 in Matthew. Uh, Chapter 24 in verse 45. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? The word sensible is a word that we have translated shrewd. Uh, Turn over a page perhaps, chapter 25 and verse 2. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. New, New American Standard has the word prudent there. And that's, that's it. So we've seen, it, we've seen the same word translated three ways. Shrewd, wise, sensible, prudent. The word is translated by those English words. So you get the idea there. There's a verse 4 of chapter 25. But the prudent took the oil in flask along with their lamps. So there's your word again. Now... A negative use of this word, and it will help us perhaps if we we look at that. You don't have to turn there, but Romans chapter 12 and verse 16 is the, the negative use of that word. It says, do not be wise in your own estimation. And the wise is our word. So we are not to be wise. We are We are not to look to our own common sense, so to speak. We are not to evaluate things according to our own sense of right or wrong or fairness. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not think of yourselves as more highly as you ought to think. And if we were to look at the Greek Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, and we were to read Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, you would read these words. The serpent was more crafty. There's your word. Crafty. So you get the idea. That's where we come, where Jesus comes up with, you need to be shrewd as serpents. So Jesus is not telling us to be like Satan because he adds an innocent. He adds an innocent to that. The word innocent means pure and unmixed, and it refers to the purity of intention. And it's only used here in Matthew 10. And in Romans 16, 19, and Philippians 2, 15. In Romans 16, 19, Paul says this. Romans 16, 19. For the report of your obedience has reached to all, therefore I am rejoicing over you, 
But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Sort of kind of the same context that we see in Matthew 10. Uh, The other passage in Philippians 2.15. Philippians 2.15 is a familiar passage to you, I believe. Paul writes, So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So here we have Paul telling us, do all things without grumbling and disputing so that we will prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent in the generation and the people amongst whom we live. So there is a reason prudence and purity or integrity are commanded here. They are like a a long pole. If you can imagine a man walking on a high wire and you have a long pole, he has a long pole for balance. On one end is prudence or shrewdness, on the other end is innocence. And that keeps you in balance. And if you move that pole to one side or the other, you're going to fall. You have prudence without innocence and you have innocence without being prudent and sensible. You're going to, you're going to, gullibility, uh, manipulation. Those are the two ends. And let's, let's talk about that. They're like a long pole that helps you balance so you can stay on the path that is most glorifying to God. Prudence must not degenerate or slide toward Cheap craftiness or scheming or calculating or being devious or manipulation. But you must also be innocent. That is not guilty of scheming or manipulation or avoiding unpopular truth. You can be innocent and be uh, innocent meaning uh, you don't know about something. Uh, You're not guilty of doing something but you can also be wrong in that you know the truth, but you don't say anything. In that case, you're guilty because you should have said something. So, how do these balance out? Innocence becomes ignorance. Potentially, it becomes naiveness, unless it's combined with prudence. And we talked about this a little bit in our class, in Proverbs 1-9. through 9. Solomon would say that the naive is not foolishness, but the cure for being naive is prudence. Shrewdness and integrity form a a crucial combination that's often found, uh, that's not often found in the Christian church. It is a tough balance to find, to have. It's nothing less, really what it is, putting these two together, is nothing less than living skillfully. It's the application of Scripture to our moment-by-moment thoughts and our actions. That's what, that's what it is when you put these two together. And Colossians chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6 is really a commentary on Matthew 10. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6, listen to what Paul says. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will will know how you should respond to each person. That's living shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Colossians is a commentary on Matthew 10. That's what it is. It's knowing what to say, when to say it, how to say it. It's living skillfully. It's living the application. It's applying the principles of Scripture, the truth of Scripture that we know, and living it out on a daily basis. This is the instruction that he gives to his disciples. Be, I'm commanding you, look, if you're going to have, if you're going to survive, if you're going to do well, where I'm sending you, you must be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. You must have, you must operate with a a sanctified mindset. A sanctified kind of mindset, the appropriate words, the appropriate timing. Proverbs 25 and verse 11 says this, Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Wow, that's good. That's Proverbs 25, 11. The right, like apples of gold and settings of silver is the word spoken in right circumstances. 
That's key. And we live all of our life in order to do that. In order to say the right thing at the right time. To know how to. And it's, it's so encouraging to hear a good, a strong evangelist talk about or watch them hear, uh, get a comment or a question from an unbeliever. They're sharing the gospel. And the unbeliever says, well, what about evil in all the place? I mean, I just don't understand how all this is evil. And it's so instructive to hear that evangelist, hear that, to take that question and immediately piggyback on it and turn it back around and, and take the gospel right back to them. That is so instructive to hear that. How do you do that? You just, you just, nothing gets you down. Immediately you know where to go with this conversation in order to take them back to the gospel. That's true. There are lots of things going on in this world, but the issue right here now is, is your relationship with Jesus Christ because you and I can't solve that problem. To take it back around is to operate as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Should I say anything? What our Lord is saying here is don't invite unnecessary arguments that divert attention from the gospel. Don't invite unnecessary arguments that divert attention from the gospel. You know, I'm not here. I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher. I'm, I'm a citizen of heaven, and I happen to be here on earth still. But I'm a citizen of heaven. So what permeates my conversation and my thoughts is I want to go home. I'm looking forward to going home. But I'm here for a while and I've been given a mission to do. And when I go home, I don't want to be unfaithful with that mission. I want to present myself pleasing to my Lord. And so that permeates everything that I think and do. Politics come, politics go, this comes, this goes. But what's constant is, I'm a citizen of heaven. And I represent my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in a coming kingdom. So that dictates everything that I do. It dictates everything that I think and how I say things. Because I don't want to misrepresent a coming kingdom. You mean this coming kingdom is, is wrangling about with words and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? No. Then why am I doing it? Why am I spending six hours, eight hours a week blogging with people? It's like banging your head against the wall. I don't, I, I just, I don't have time. I've got to study the word. I've got to tell people about Christ. God in his sovereignty and his good providence will bring them along. I'm available. Yes, here I am. You've heard the truth. Just know I'm here. I'm here for you. And off I go to share the truth with someone else. That's his point. Don't invite unnecessary arguments. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in your Bibles. I'll show you the Apostle Paul's life in about three or four verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 20. Paul begins in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I, might, so that I may win more to the Jews... I became a Jew so that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being under the law myself, so that I might win those who are under the law to those who are without law as without law I lived or I thought, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I could by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. That's life as shrewd as a serpent and innocent as a dove. You know just what to do. I'm not going to. I'm not going to associate you because you're not associate, you don't read the same version of Bible. 
that has nothing to do with the truth of gospel. I'm not going to let that kind of thing hinder fellowship. I shouldn't. You believe that we ought to rest on Sunday and we shouldn't do any work on Sunday? Okay, I'll go along with that. We can fellowship, we can listen to the truth, I share things with you, I'll I'll go, okay, that's fine. I understand that it's not mandated by Scripture. I understand that that belief is, is a misunderstanding of Scripture. But that's okay. We'll still talk about Scripture, we'll still grow Maybe we'll grow through that. Maybe our knowledge will reach a point where we understand that, you know, it really doesn't say that in the New Testament. You're right, it doesn't. That's the life of Paul. He became all things. It doesn't mean he compromised. It doesn't mean he compromised truth. But for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the salvation of people, I did it. I will do it. My life has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and it is his life. Paul says, it's no longer mine. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is what he has called me to do. And this I shall do. Live as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. So the mission is to wolves, and our Lord commands his disciples to be shrewd, avoiding conflicts and attacks where possible, but they must also be innocent. In other words, not be so cautious and suspicious that alertness degenerates into fear or vagueness. In other words, we minimize sin or repentance seems to be an elusive teaching in this church. Or we reject the Lordship of Christ. We just say, all you need to do is just raise your hand and say a prayer and you're in. You don't count the cost. That's not the gospel. In verse 23 of, chapter, of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 24 and below, you're gonna see, we're going to see the meaning of discipleship. You want to follow Christ? Okay, verse 24 and following. Let's see what it says. And then when you're finished studying, are you sure you want to follow Christ? You sure? Strangely enough, Churches more often invert the two. They invert the two that our Lord is talking about here. Proving to be as guilty as serpents and stupid as doves. Be wise so that you do not stir up unnecessary conflicts. Be innocent, but do not become guilty by fearing man rather than God. That's his formula for living. Beloved, we have to know that accountability is a four-letter word to an unbeliever. Since the first encounter between God and sinful man, humanity humanity has pointed to his spouse, kids, neighbor, preacher, co-worker, ball, school, society, politician, and probably ancestry to excuse themselves of what they have done or the way they live. When you see The response by Adam and Eve in the garden, that response is generally the response of humanity. They evade accountability by hiding and blaming someone else. That's general response. And when you add everybody's different personality to it, it looks a little bit different. But at the core, when you peel back everything, you're hiding. You don't want to be accountable. You're going to blame someone else. That's what you're doing. So when you counsel somebody... You can pretty much figure those things are back there somewhere. They don't want to change what they're doing. I like what I'm doing. Therefore, I don't want to change. I don't want accountability. So Jesus now identifies the four areas of attack. These are areas of life in which the attack comes. And the first thing he mentions in verse 17 is from the attack will come from religious people from religious people. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in the synagogues. And the principle here, very quickly, the principle here is be aware of people that are zealous, most passionate about their religion. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16 and verse 2. John 16, verse 2. Note what our Lord says here. They will make you outcasts From the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think 
that he is offering service to God. We see that in religions today. There was the, 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 the kamikaze religion of the Japanese thinking that, thinking that when they kill somebody, they're doing a service to their God. You have it in Islam today. People kill others and they think they're doing a service to God and they have all kinds of things waiting for them in heaven. The day has arrived. The day's been here for a long time where people thought that they were doing a service to God when they kill Christians. That's the day in which we live. Now, Paul was, you remember Paul, he was zealous before he became a believer. Remember how zealous he was? He even murdered Christians. Paul was a murderer before he became a believer. Why? Why the religious people? Because they are most offended by the truth. The devout, the zealous, they are most offended by the truth. And so they react. They hate the gospel. Their pride is wounded, and so they attack. And we have the description of the religious leaders in Jesus' day in Matthew chapter 23. Can't wait to get there to see that. Scathing statements that he makes about the religious leaders of the day. So we need to be wise and we need to be innocent because there are people who will do this. And the second area from which, uh, the second of four areas from which a response or areas of persecution where it will come from is from the government, from secular government in verse 18. You will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. When we uh, look at Acts chapter 12 and verse 1, we read this. Now about the time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he killed James. That's James, the John's, the apostle John's brother. He was the second martyr as far as we know after Stephen. He puts Peter in prison as, and has every intention of killing Peter as well. So why would a secular government attack Christians? You you look at uh, Russia, for example. When the wall came down and believers were able to go into Russia, they had, believers had a wonderful reputation in Russia, even before the wall came down. And you know why? Because believers have a great work ethic. They like that work ethic. That religion produces a great work ethic. And they like that. That's attractive. They're they're willing to take that in because the Colossians 3.23 says, uh, says, uh, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God, not as unto men. All of those statements like statements that we see in Scripture that compel us to be good workers, conscientious workers. So the secular government, we might ask, why would secular government attack Christians? Verse 18, you will be brought before governors and kings. The little prepositional phrase, see that? For my sake. That's why they do it. For my sake. That's why they do what they do. John chapter 15, the night before our Lord was crucified. In verse 18 and 19, he says this, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. So secular governments attack Christians because God has chosen us out of the world, granted us redemption. And the world doesn't like that. Secular governments do not like that, and that's why they react. Even though the work ethic may be good, even though the contribution to society, so to speak, is moral, it's beneficial to the neighbors, it contributes to the improvement of lifestyle, even though all those things are true, because you name Christ, they don't like you. Is that not a supernatural message? That's a supernatural message. There is no humanly logical reason to persecute Christians and there is every reason to embrace Christians their work ethic their thinking of others as more important than themselves I mean it's perfect except that we name the name of Christ 
Now, you know there's somebody behind all these secular governments, right? The God of this world, Satan. They really hate Jesus, but they can't touch Jesus, but they can touch us. And so they respond to us. They can't touch Jesus, so they respond to us. So the disciples of Jesus throughout time have been touched. Now, our attitude towards persecution is expressed, should, uh, should be this. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, listen to this wonderful statement that Paul makes. For to you it has been granted, there's your word grace, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You see, suffering is a grace, is God's grace in our life. Paul, in Philippians 3, desired to know, to be a part of the fellowship of his sufferings. But that's what the secular world does. That's why they attack Christians. Now, why would a government get involved in persecuting Christians? I mean, why would, it, why would they think it's beneficial after all the potential contribution? Well, there's several reasons, and most of all, it's pride and jealousy. Remember, the Romans perceived Christians as a threat because of their loyalty to God. Remember that? And the emperor, the Caesar, wanted to be worshipped. And when, we, when Christians would say they are allegiance to God and they would claim to worship God and only Him alone, Caesar was jealous. His pride was hurt. They were threatened by that. And so they respond by killing Christians. Communism persecutes Christians because atheism is a central tenet of communism. Christianity is a threat to them. Islam theology is absolutely intolerant of every other belief. But what's behind all of this, as we've already noted, the ultimate reason for persecution is Satan. Satan uses the governments of this world to persecute. You remember one of the temptations by Satan to Jesus in the 40-day temptation? Remember that? Or after 40 days, he fasted there. The Satan came to tempt him. One of those temptations that Satan offered was to offer to give to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. We have to look at this passage. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Uh, beginning at verse 6, verse 6 and 7. Luke chapter 4. Matthew has, of course, the temptation as well, but uh, Luke words it in a certain way that brings out, I think, the fullness of what the temptation was. Luke chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. And the devil said to him, he, said, he led him up, verse 5, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You see, you hear that in a moment of time. Probably this was the Satan showing Jesus the kingdoms as they existed and as they would exist in the future. In a moment of time, there was spread out before our Lord Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. From the very first one to the very last one. All of the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time, he says... All of these were spread out. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me. 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the god of this world. The god of this world has blinded the minds of those so that they would not believe. It has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Jesus didn't argue with that. He didn't say, Satan, you're nuts. Jesus, God, the Father, hasn't given you anything. He didn't say that. He didn't deny anything Satan said, except the misapplication of Scripture. So behind all of this is Satan Satan is the God of this world. And while it is true, Romans 13, that God ordains government, yes, God ordains government, it is also true that government is a tool in Satan's arsenal. Not every government, but Satan can be. You read in the book of Daniel, you read in the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah, and you will find 
references to Satan behind evil governments. So why does God allow governments to oppose the gospel with such open hostility? Well, God is sovereign, so why allow such hostility here? Look what verse 18 says. As a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. As a testimony. So why would secular government attack Christians? For my sake. Excuse me. Verse 18, if, if God is sovereign, <clears throat> why, why allow uh, such hostility as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles? The reason believers are brought before government officials is to give testimony of God's character and grace. That's why they're brought before government officials. You remember... Uh, the, the preacher in Houston who had the opportunity on Larry King Live. Is Jesus the only way? National audience. Here it is. Spotlights are on you. National audience, you have now the platform to tell everybody, yes, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Nope. Didn't do it. Afraid of man, a fear of what people will do, fear of losing his congregation, fear of maybe not being asked back to the Larry King live show. Whatever the reason, you drop the ball. Big time, drop the ball. Perhaps that will be you or me someday. I pray that God would not let us drop the ball. Are we capable of dropping it? Oh yeah, <laughs> we're capable of punting it. But I pray that God will strengthen us in that day so that we will not drop the ball. We may very well have that opportunity in the government in the times in which we live. Why does God, being sovereign, at the same time allow such hostility as a testimony to these people of His amazing grace? The reason believers are brought before these officials is to give testimony. Satan is not in control. It may seem as though he is in control, but he is not ultimately in control. And I want to show you another passage. Again, you have to see this. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Paul's life. You know that when he wrote this letter to the Philippians, he is under house arrest in Rome, chained to a guard, Three, four, six hour shifts, you know that Paul was not dropping the ball. When you have a captive audience, literally, a Roman soldier chained to you 24 7, they're going to hear the gospel. And they did. Look at Paul's perspective in Philippians 1 12. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Wow. Paul understood that God is sovereign. Even though Satan has a measure of authority, God is still providential He is still sovereign. And he recognized and Paul knew that God is turning around, turning all things around for the good of his people and the glory of his own name. After after reading that, look at chapter 4 and verse 22. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. (laughs) <laughs> somebody who is listening to Paul, their praetorian guard, their families, their maids, somebody became believers in that process. Even those of Caesar's household send their greetings. Are you kidding? Caesar says he's God. And now believers have infiltrated because it is God's good pleasure 
to bring believers up before government officials as a testimony to them. And the reason they do it is for my sake, Jesus says. So verses 19 and 20 in closing. Verses 19 and 20. Here are comforting words. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you will say. For it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. That's referring to the Holy Spirit, of course. Mentioned here as the Spirit of your Father. God will provide the words through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not here saying it is wrong to prepare lessons. He's not saying it's wrong to study. There are actually people who believe that you should not study. Trust in the Holy Spirit. Just step into the pulpit and God will give you what to say. I heard a story one time of a church whose preacher did that. (laughs) Whose preacher did that. Of course, the parsonage is right next to the church. So what the church did was buy him another parsonage about five miles away. So he would have more time to think as he's walking. Get it? He is not, our Lord is not promoting extemporaneous or spontaneous speaking here. He's not, that's not his purpose. This is a life-threatening circumstance. And I want to give you, in closing, I want to give you an example of that kind of, the Lord will give you what to say, the Lord will protect you. This, is, this is, comes from a real situation in history. When Mary became the Queen of England, she worked to bring England back to the Roman Catholic Church. One of her first acts was to arrest Bishop Ridley and Bishop Latimer and Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer. After serving time in the Tower of London, these three were taken to Oxford in September of 1555 to be examined by the Lord's Commissioner in Oxford's Divinity School. When Ridley was asked if he believed the Pope was heir to the authority of Peter as the foundation of the church... He replied that the church is not built on any man, but on the truth Peter confessed, that Christ was the Son of God. Ridley said that he could not honor the Pope in Rome since the papacy was seeking its own glory, not the glory of God. Neither Ridley nor Latimer could accept the Roman Catholic Mass as a sacrifice of Christ. Latimer told the commissioners, Christ made one oblation and sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and that a perfect sacrifice. Neither there does not need to be, nor can there be, any other propitiatory sacrifice. And of course, these opinions were deeply offensive to the Roman Catholic theologians. Both Ridley and Latimer were were burned at the stake in Oxford on October 16th, 1555, just anniversary would be 10 days from now as he was being tied to the stake Ridley prayed O heavenly father I give unto thee most hearty thanks that you have called me to be a professor of you a professor of thee even unto death I beseech thee Lord God have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies and then they died on the stake As it turns out, uh, the Lord did answer that prayer. At the years after 1555, saw many great reformers. Alexander McLaren, the great expositor preacher, Charles Spurgeon, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Whitfield, the Wesleys. The Lord did answer his prayer. But England has gone dark again. It's in need of reformation again. The beloved in this country, the time is coming to have the blessed opportunity to witness to governing authorities. And I'd encourage you to pray for those men who represent us and pray for their strength, those who are believers. Pray that they would be strong. They truly are in an arena of wolves. Pray for these men that they would be strong to the truth, that they would be faithful, that God would sustain them. And pray for one another. 
Perhaps God will grace us with the opportunity to stand before a judge someday. And may we not punt. May we have the strength to say the truth and trust God for the consequences. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you, Father, for this clear word that you've given us this morning. Father, we need your wisdom and we need your strength to live shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. God, we need your wisdom to live skillfully, to live pleasing to you. It is easy for us to be faithful now when there is no threat. God, the time may come when you would bless us with the opportunity to suffer for your namesake. Should that time come in our lifetimes and in this country, we ask, Father, that you would cause the church of Jesus Christ to shine, to be faithful, to be strong, to be a pillar of truth. Please don't let us deny you, Father. Strengthen us to be faithful. Strengthen us to persevere. And cause us to always remember we are citizens of heaven and we're here but a short time. And may that govern all of our thoughts and all of our actions. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
in obedience to scripture. We do not do this in order to be acceptable to God or in order to be saved. None of those things at all. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. So these two people that have come to be baptized, Sue Vozar and Jonathan Albert, they understand that God has saved them by his grace. They are new creatures, and they're here to share with you how God changed their life and to say, my life is changed. I'm no longer my own. Jesus is my master. He is my Lord, and I follow him. So this is an act of obedience. This is, this is an act just like any other act of obedience, uh, but it is an important one. And I know that you're praying for them. I want to encourage you to, to uh, say something to them after, the, after their, this service is over. Be an encouragement to them. I know that you will. I know that you're praying for them. So the first one is uh, Sue Vozar. I'm shaking a little bit. My name is Sue Vozar, and I'd like to begin with a prayer. Father, may I, with the help of your word, convey my sincere testimony. Amen. Since I was saved in September of 2005, I have found that the Bible, God's true word, has always blessed my heart. So I'm going to relay my testimony interposed with the first parable that I really, the first one I really understood after my eyes and ears had been opened by the grace of God. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24, the prodigal son. Even now when I meditate upon this story and the actions of the father, it never fails to bring me to the Lord in thankfulness and joy. Beginning with verses 11 through 13. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. I was raised in a Roman Catholic home and attended Catholic school. I was taught that Jesus died on the cross for me. I did have that, albeit rather shaky, foundation. But I hated church. When I was little, the Mass was said in Latin, and the Gospel was given in both Slovak and English. Church was something you had to do to go to heaven. The incense made me sick to my stomach. I was a rebellious and disobedient child, I preferred solitary activities, I didn't have friends, I didn't want people close to me. I left home at 18 and went to Florida with a guy I barely knew, and from there I hitchhiked to Denver with another guy I barely knew. I considered myself a hippie, a free spirit. But I lived a drugged up, hedonistic lifestyle. I was, in biblical terms, living recklessly. Reckless conveys the idea of an utterly debauched lifestyle. That was me. But God kept placing believers in my path. I was always impressed with them because they had something I didn't. Contentment, or what seemed to me to be contentment. It was what I was searching for, but I could never find it. I finally got a whiff of self-preservation and joined the Army when I was 22. I was scared. I had gotten the sense that if I stayed where I was and what I was doing, I would die. Jesus was standing at the door and knocking, but I wasn't ready to invite him in. I knew it would change my life. I loved my sin, and unfortunately, I had further down that dark road to go. Continuing with verses 14 through 16. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I drank heavily in the army, and at that time, 
methamphetamine speed and marijuana pot was easy to get and use. I married a man prone to violence and had an affair with a married man, got pregnant and had an abortion. I never thought of it as a baby. I was so selfishly saturated in my sin. I got divorced, got transferred, got married, continued to drink and do drugs and got divorced again. God continued to place believers in my path, people who had gotten out of that lifestyle and had the light of Jesus surrounding them. I believe that God continued to call me because I never totally rejected the message of the gospel. I just didn't want to leave my sin. I got discharged from the Army in 1986, came back to PA, got a job, got married, and divorced for the third and final time. I no longer used drugs. Alcohol was my master. I restarted my promiscuous lifestyle, trying desperately to find love and peace, the elusive concept of cont con contentment. But I was perishing, and deep down inside, I knew it. Continuing with verse 17 through 21. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was a still, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I was waking from the lie of this world very slowly. I tried to go to church and stop drinking, but it was all in my strength. I thought I had to get my act together. From my early teaching, I had to be good enough for God to forgive me, but it wasn't working. I could hear Jesus knocking. Then one day, I saw a Joyce Meyer program. Yes, God can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. And this is what she said. God knows what he is getting when he gets you. You are no surprise to God. You can't change yourself. You have to say to him, if you don't change me, I'm going to stay this way. Now, that may not be completely scriptural, but God was pleased to use it. I got down on my face right there in front of my heinous pink barca lounger, and I wept. I cried like I have never cried before. I felt as if my heart was going to burst with the knowledge of who I was. I poured out my pain and choked out words. I asked Jesus to save me. I realized finally I had no time. I was already dead. And I was sick of my sin and tired of living a life that Satan had convinced me that I loved. And do you know what happened? Verses 22 through 24. But the father said to his servants, Bring the quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. My life was changed instantly by God's unsurpassable grace and mercy. I was a new creature. My old life was gone, and while I continue to battle the old man, I can never go back to what I was. That person is not there anymore. I was delivered from my alcoholism and promiscuity. I was no longer searching for a love in this world. I now have a hope that can never be disappointed, a peace that can never be understood, 
a joy that can never be diminished and a love that can never be exhausted. I continue to struggle with fleshly rebellion and disobedience. I just don't like to be told what to do. At first, I thought I was baptized as a baby, so why do I need to do it again? After all, God knows I love him. Jesus knows I believe in him and his salvation. But baptism is commanded by Jesus. From reading the Bible and getting clarification from the church's statements, I understand that baptism is the outward expression of the new inward life. God is squeezing me out of my hermit-like isolationist life. He has pressed me to find a Christian community, and he has led me here. I want to learn how to be part of the community. So I have to tell you all, I am a little rough around the edges socially, kind of like the person who lives in the woods and only comes out for supplies. I cling to my own way of looking at things, but I am learning. I love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind, and I want to obey him. I have been reading and studying the Bible for eight years this month, and it is high time that I demonstrate the fact that I believe the gospel and I have received Jesus Christ as Lord in front of a group of people with whom I can share my gifts, my life, and my love of Christ. And I'm going to close with the first Bible verse I ever memorized. And I recite this from memory. I really don't remember what version it is. And it's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn entirely away from evil. It will be health to your body and moistening to your bones. Thank you. May God bless you all and keep you. Sue, that was wonderful. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Uh, we praise God for you, for how he has protected you through the years and granted you life. And we do welcome this act of obedience. And we rejoice with you that he has been gracious to you and all of us. Based upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Next uh, gentleman is uh, Jonathan Albert. I'm Jonathan Albert, and uh, I was born in a kind of Christian home, I guess. I was baptized uh, Maronite Catholic, and if you don't know that, they pretty much just read the service in Arabic half the time, and you don't know what's going on. And So I pretty much knew nothing as a child, and I kind of went to a Roman Catholic school since or until second grade, and I really didn't remember anything after that. And pretty much that's the way I could describe my entire life until I got saved, is that I didn't understand any of the Bible. Even in high school, when I began to read the Bible, I got twice through it, and I probably couldn't recite to you a word. I didn't know this, that, or the other thing, I was wondering, 
why are all these building descriptions in there essentially but that's just my theological darkness at least uh, as a kid I was pretty selfish and oblivious I would always pride myself on being the good kid like when I would play with my little brother I would always make him the bad guy because I told him the good guys always win and I was pretty much just a hypocrite when I got into college and I got involved in the uh, the worst possible thing you could do on the internet. I just lied about it all the time and I made it seem like I was too good for that and everything else and it was just horrendous. I was a very uh, immoral man and I was pretty much a slave also to video games, just staying up till the umpteen hours of the night. I can't even tell why. I was literally boring myself to death, just sitting there. And eventually in high school, I did join a youth group called Happening. And I think it's Anglican or whatever. I really don't know. And even then, I was pretty much in the dark. I didn't know or really understand much. And even the preaching that was at that place, um, essentially they were just focusing on Jesus' suffering and not why I needed it. Of, oh, here's a good guy. Look what all he did. Why don't you come and follow him? Not he bore your iniquities and everything else. And, yeah, pretty much I was unchanged by happening. Near the end, I started to enjoy it, but I was pretty much oblivious, uh, dumb as a rock. And afterwards, though, I did begin to listen to ministries like Grace to You and Through the Bible and I don't know when it happened, but my disgusting internet habit began to decrease and eventually disappear. I had a relapse into it a little while later, but something was going on. And eventually, though, I did read uh, 1 John, I think it's, yeah, 1 John 2.27, where it says, you don't need that anyone to teach you. And at that point, all of my knowledge that I had gained was just by the teaching ministries of John MacArthur and Vernon McGee. And that just destroyed my sense of that I had life at all because I didn't know anything but what other men told me. And when it says you don't need that anyone teach you, I knew I absolutely relied on them. And I was literally terrified. I felt like Isaiah, woe to me, I am undone. And I really didn't know what to do. I spent that night terrified. And then when I woke up in the morning, I was just looking through John MacArthur's libraries. And of course, his sermons ended at 226 and began again at 228. And Vernon McGee didn't really offer that much. He was basically talking about assurance, which was a completely foreign doctrine to me at the time, and so I really didn't get an answer. I, w I stayed terrified for a couple of days, and then I kind of forgot about it, and I really don't know. And that's why I've been, I guess, the more I need to be more diligent to make sure that I am saved because it almost feels like I kind of slid in. That I had the moment when I knew I was dead, but I almost didn't come alive until later. Like at one point, I was uh, hearing John MacArthur on a commentary on John where uh, I think it was in the upper room where Jesus says, Um, 
essentially he says, like, you will ask the Father, saying that you don't need to pray to me, you can pray directly to the Father. And that, again, it terrified me because I always just prayed to Jesus because, you know, Jesus, he's a nice guy, he understands, but no, you're praying to the Lord God omnipotent. I was very scared at that point, and I really didn't even lift my face off the floor when I was praying that night. I really even hardly heard myself speak. And I don't know, just the Lord has changed me, and that's the only way I know, really, that I'm saved, because I've given up a lot, and now I actually am beginning to understand Scripture, and I'm just very thankful, and I want to obey him in this. And it was not until recently that I started coming here, and I just wanted to obey him in coming to church, and I'm just thankful that it's different. So Christ has saved you, and you know this because you've trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins. Yes. I finally understand the gospel now. Good. And he's beginning to weed away, and you're beginning to detach yourself from old habits? Yes. Beginning to grow in Christ? Yes, I like the hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, that, I feel, is very appropriate to baptism. I mean baptism in the Holy Spirit, not the water symbol. Being saved. Yes. Yeah. And this water, water, you, we understand, is symbolic of what God has done in your life. Right. Um, so, what's your favorite book of the Bible right now? Probably the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews? Yes. I love how it magnifies Christ. It does indeed. It does indeed. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, we rejoice with you as well that God has granted you life. We rejoice with you and we look forward to seeing you grow. We look forward to being a part of your life. And may God grant you to have a great impact with the people that you work around. Based upon your profession of faith, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Let's plow in a closing prayer, and then after the prayer, you're dismissed. Our gracious Father, thank you for sal salvation. Thank you for saving Sue, and thank you for saving Jonathan. Father, we thank you that you, not only with salvation, there is new life, but practices, old practices that are not pleasing to you, and worldly practices begin to fade away, and they begin to be left aside. And it's by your grace and your strength that these, that is so. We pray for Sue and Jonathan that as they grow in their knowledge and understanding of their Savior, that, Father, you would be pleased to make them more like your Savior, your, your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen them and cause them to pursue holiness. Give them a, a deeper and renewed hatred for sin. And may we as a family be faithful to pray, to shepherd them, to disciple them in a ways that is good in ways that are helpful, in ways that do please you. We thank you, God, for this testimony. Thank you for saving. Thank you for being so merciful and gracious to us, so undeserving as we are. We ask, Father, for your blessings as we leave here, that you would grant your, you grant your protection to us, give us wisdom to live skillfully, bring us back this evening to enjoy uh, James chapter 1 as we look at how to deal with trials. And in our Savior's name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.